Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Boulevard Baptist Church in Anderson, South Carolina. Welcome to those here in the sanctuary and welcome to those worshiping faithfully via the live stream. For those that are seated in the sanctuary, we ask that you would take a moment to fill out the contact tracing form that can be found in the pew rack most directly in front of you. And for our guests this morning, welcome to you. You will find a welcome card also in the pew rack in front of you. And we'd love if you'd fill that out to give us a little more information about you and drop it in the offering plate when it comes around. In your order of worship, you will find a special insert this morning. This tells you about a new partnership we have with Scarlett Jasper, a CBF filled personnel. She started a Christmas shoebox ministry in Kentucky and Tennessee. You can read about it, but be sure to take note of the back, which has a packing list. At the end of this morning's service, someone will be at each exit handing out shoeboxes for anyone who would like one to join in with this ministry. We'll start collecting filled shoeboxes all through the month of October, and if anyone would like us to do shopping for you, we would be happy to do that. We're excited to get involved with this min meaningful ministry, and we hope you are too. Now would you please join me in the reading of our Sorsum Corda. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise.
Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we are here this morning, Lord, but make us truly present, present to your spirit, present to the lives of those around us, present to your voice calling to us, calling us to care for your people, for all of your people, to love people as we find them or as they become. Yes, Lord, teach us and make us present as we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anytime we come together to worship God, it is vital that we do so honestly and humbly, with contrite hearts and with contrite spirits, willingly lifting up before God all of the sins and all of the shortcomings that try, though we might, nonetheless do still daily beset our ways. 
So here we are gathered together once more, and what an awesome opportunity it is for us here in this sanctuary gathered all across the world via the live stream to in this one moment together silently bring our sins and shortcomings before God. Join me, please, in this silent prayer of confession. Having now lifted up those sins and shortcomings, hear now this wondrous news. Just as certainly as the Holy Scriptures tell us that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, so certainly do those same Scriptures tell us that through the life and through the death and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have all been forgiven. And in gratitude and in thanksgiving for that forgiveness, let us continue onward now in our prayer. O oh God, we come before you this morning grateful for the gift of Christian community, grateful for the opportunity of fellowship, grateful to be among others who, like we ourselves, worship you in spirit and in truth, others like ourselves who seek to live in the way of your Son, Jesus. On this day, O oh God, we ask that you would remind us anew of the gift of difference within Christian community, of the gift that comes from being one body with many members, of the fullness that comes from pairing an eye and an ear and a nose and a mouth, a stomach and an arm and a leg and a foot. Together, O oh God, we constitute one body. Help us to remember that heads alone, or stomachs alone, or hands alone, or feet alone, or members alone, can never reach the full stature of your Son, Jesus. Your Holy Spirit calls us as Christ followers to live in unity, O oh God. So let us model that unity here at Boulevard that others might see the strength of our fellowship and might strive to work for unity in their own lives and communities. We think this morning of Donna Bradbury and her family as they mourn the passing of her father, Norman Smith. We ask you to comfort them in their mourning and give them the peace of your Holy Spirit, just as we ask the same for all those in our midst who are currently grieving and bereaved. You are the God who spoke the world into being and who calls us further up and further into the full humanity that you will for your people. Help us help one another to grow into this calling. Bind us, harmonize us, unify us, we pray. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Having now prayed together, having confessed our sins and shortcomings together, having been forgiven together, let us hear now together words from the Scripture, words that come to us from chapter 15 of the book of Acts, where we will read the first part, after which the second part will be read to us. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, saying, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. 
So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. Well, the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and then listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? God of abundance, right now we say thank you as we give. In our giving, hear our heartfelt gratitude for all that you are and all that we have. Bless these gifts for your mission in the world. Bless the other gifts we have to bring to your mission, opening our eyes to how you are calling us to participate. Make us generous in your image. Make us compassionate in your image. Make us faithful in your image. As your love for us never ends, may our love for you never end. And may we show it in all that we do and say. Receive these gifts with our love and multiply them in your love among us and for all people. Amen. Our second scripture reading is Acts as well, 15, 22 through 31. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, 
we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. When they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Be with us this morning, God. Quiet our hearts. May our spirits be still that we might hear from you. Amen. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it is a wild and emotional experience like those tongues of fire that compelled Peter and the apostles out the door that day and into the streets. 
Sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it is a dark and disruptive experience. Like when Peter was called to the home of Cornelius, the Gentile, and compelled to go in and embrace him. Other times, however, the Holy Spirit comes upon us in an altogether different way, in a calmer, quieter kind of way, in a way that settles us down and opens us up, in a way that compels us to be more reasonable with one another and to hear one another out. We see the Holy Spirit blows wherever it will, as Jesus says, and it comes upon us in whatever ways it deems most necessary in the moment. And while the more emotional and disruptive movements of the Holy Spirit are those that make for better stories and get far more attention in sermons and in Bible studies, this other movement of the Holy Spirit this movement that enables us to calm down and open our hearts and minds and eyes and ears to one another, this movement of the Holy Spirit is nonetheless every bit as important and every bit as world transformative as those other movements of the Holy Spirit. Consider this. Those first Christians in Jerusalem had no love lost for these new Gentile Christians. You know, these new believers with their different ways of seeing the world and their dogged determination on bending the rules in ways more pleasing and convenient to them. And then for their part, these new Gentile Christians had no love lost for these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem either what with their insistence upon tradition and law and their dogged resistance to any new ideas or change. You see, this was the way these two sides viewed one another at the time, even if the reality were far more complex and far more nuanced than this. Yes, it's a fact about Christian history that is often forgotten. That our story almost imploded not even a decade in. That we almost self-destructed before the movement even got off the ground. But it's true. Go back and read Acts, ch Acts chapter 15 very carefully and you will see. It was by no means a foregone conclusion in those early days that Christianity would continue to spread throughout the world. Because you see, here in its infancy, two sides had staked out their positions. And neither of them in this consequential moment was prepared to give an inch. On one side, you had those from Judea, concentrated in Jerusalem and led by Peter, James, and John. On the other side, you had those spread out around the Mediterranean and led by Paul and Barnabas. It's a tale as old as time, dear family. A song as old as rhyme. Two sides of a larger family have clashing views on how to handle a moment of cultural upheaval. One side naturally rallies around order and tradition and the way things have always been while the other side pushes for change and progress and revolution. And with such division inevitably comes suspicion and caricaturizing, and that suspicion and caricaturizing only heightens as it continues to self-perpetuate. Well, such was the case within Christendom in or around the year 45 A.D., and there in that fractious climate, Paul and Barnabas and the boys one afternoon saw on the internet where the Jerusalem Christians had been taking their side to task. 
And for their part, it should be noted, these Jerusalem Christians had been taking them to task because they had seen on the internet days earlier where the Gentile Christians had been taking them to task. You know, posting sarcastic memes about them and spreading misinformation. Now, I'm obviously being flip here, but I'm doing this to make a point, which is to remind us that we are really not that different from our early Christian forebears. No, in reality, what happened was this. Some Christians from Jerusalem came over to Antioch and began telling these new Gentile Christians that to really be Christians, that is to be real Christians, they had to abide by certain formal rules of Judaism, such as, and most particularly, circumcision. And to be fair, this was in response to news that they had been receiving about how these new Gentile Christians were being utterly reckless with the faith that they'd just inherited. How these new Gentile Christians were carelessly bucking 2,000 years of settled law and practice. Ways of being that had bound and sustained the Jewish community for millennia. And so, according to the text, when these folks from Jerusalem came and confronted these folks in Antioch, they had, quote, no small dissension and debate about all of this. Which is Luke, the author's diplomatic way of saying they came close to killing one another. And so, in response, Paul and Barnabas from Antioch reached out to Peter and James in Jerusalem and said, in effect, look, fellas, we got to talk about all of this. To which Peter and James replied, in effect, you're right, we do. And so they set up a town hall meeting in Jerusalem where all of these things could be brought to a head. Oh, to think of the network ad revenue that could have been made on that. So let us picture them there. Both sides committed and passionate. Both sides convinced that they are right and the other's wrong. Both sides ready to prove the wisdom of their position and the folly of the others. And let us watch now what happens. The Gentile Christians speak up first, trying to make their case. But then a sizable faction of the Jerusalem contingent stands up and essentially shouts them down. And it already looks like the idea is doomed from the start. Like there's no way that anything constructive might possibly come out of this. But then, according to the text, quote, the apostles and elders met together. In other words, both groups decided to block out the screamers and the shouters and the Facebook warriors. And instead, they huddled together and, quote, considered the matter. And according to the text, as they did, there was, quote, much debate. Much debate. But hear now what happens next. Suddenly, Peter... The same Peter on whom the Holy Spirit has been working since his encounter with Cornelius. Suddenly Peter stands up and says, I have found that God has made no distinction between them and us. At which point Paul and Barnabas then speak up and say, yes, thank you for saying that, Peter. And listen, here are certain signs and wonders that God has performed among us. Signs and wonders, you'll note, that are not at all unlike those that God has been performing among you yourselves. Well, then upon hearing this, James, the staunchest traditionalist of them all, James, stunning everyone, suddenly stands up and says, You know, this actually agrees with the words of the prophets. Therefore, he goes on, I've reached the decision For myself, that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, 
and from fornication, and from whatever has been strangled, and from blood. To which Paul, later reflecting on this very moment in his letter to the Galatians, writes, The Jerusalem Christians asked only one thing of us, which we were eager to do. And there in that moment, compromise was made. And fellowship was restored. And the Christian story was enabled to move forward. Now, mind you, this was not the sum total of what these Gentile Christians were asking for. Nor were these the terms the Jerusalem Christians were most in favor of themselves. What happened here was this. The Holy Spirit of God came upon these Christians in that consequential moment. During that meeting that has since come to be known as the Jerusalem Council. And rather than inflame passions or incite disruption this time, the Holy Spirit of God opened these Christians ears and eyes and minds and hearts, enabling them to reason with one another rather than to revile one another. And we are here today because and only, only because they did. Come, saith the Lord in the Scripture, and let us reason together. Well, all thanks be unto God that these early Christians listened to the Scripture and did. Of course I think my opinion is right. The great Christian writer and apologist G.K. Chesterton claimed, or else it wouldn't be my opinion. It's a great line. Of course we think our opinions are right. Or else they wouldn't be our opinions. But Chesterton, more than just about anyone, also understood the vital importance of reason, of holding a position while remaining open to the position of others, of being respectful of differences, and of having the humility of knowing that compromise is not only almost always possible, but of knowing that compromise is almost always the wisest and most gracious option. H.G. Wells, he once wrote of his great literary and philosophical rival, is perhaps the largest hearted person I know, which is why he is so entirely wrong about this. Isn't just hearing a sentence like this a cool drink of water? For those of us parched in a sweltering desert, I disagree with him, but he's a good man with a good heart and good intentions. When did we lose the ability to make such concessions? Reason, dear family, can cover a multitude of sins, just like love. Because reason is, in fact, a form of love, or if not a form of love, a hybrid with love. For reason is a combination of several fruits of the Spirit, a combination of love, patience, kindness, and generosity. And when the Holy Spirit wills to come upon us in the form of reason... It can take two sides who are committed to hating one another, committed to destroying one another, committed to tearing one another down and eviscerating everything the other stands for, and can suddenly open each side's eyes to the wisdom of the others and to the validity of the others and to the humanity of the other and to that which binds us all together. 
That's what happened that fateful day in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit of God came upon those divided disciples and reminded them that they have been made one through the resurrection of Christ. One family, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. May it be so among us as Christians today. May the Holy Spirit breathe upon us anew and remind us of this once more. May all the things that threaten to divide us as a global family pale in comparison to the death and resurrection of Christ which unites us. May we be more charitable with others. And more open to hearing and tolerating other points of view. May we be slower to caricaturize and critique others. And quicker to give others the benefit of the doubt. And to remember that they, like we ourselves, are dealing with countless difficulties in their lives that we know nothing about. And that they, like we ourselves, are trying to remain committed to Christ throughout it all. May we remember that, yes, of course we think our opinion is right. For it's our opinion. But that still we should have the generosity of spirit not to turn our backs on our brothers and sisters just because they don't happen to share it. Dear family, the world needs us to be Christians right now. Not just passionate Christians and not just disruptive Christians, but also reasonable Christians. So come Holy Spirit, we pray, so that that which was accomplished by your disciples in Jerusalem can be accomplished by us once more, enabling the Christian story to move forward still, drawing ever more people and to this ancient and ever-growing family. To which all God's people said, Amen. And I will now be down front to receive any who might this day wish to proclaim a desire to follow Jesus Christ as Lord, or who might this day want to join this community of faith here at Boulevard as we strive to reason together and make things ever more on earth as they are in heaven.
As we go forward this day, unified in purpose, unified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord and seeking to help unite the world outside these doors, may we do so by making manifest everywhere we go the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we live by the Spirit. Amen.